Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, friends, welcome to the Alpha Presbyterian uh, Church. I am Ed Soto. I'm the, the minister here for, for our guests. Uh, welcome for this uh, joint Good Friday service uh, with uh, myself and uh, Tom Friedrichs and uh, Pastor Sam. Sam, I never actually had the last name. Canals. Canals. Yes. But Pastor Sam Canals of First Southern Baptist yes. over across the river. So, uh, folks, I, I hope you are blessed this evening. It's um, going to be a, a pretty simple, straightforward uh, service, but we hope it will be very meaningful uh, and, and very impactful as we discuss and look at uh, the cross of Christ. Uh, but before we, we begin, I'd like to open us up with a word of prayer. Let, let, us, let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, today is good, good Friday. It's an oxymoron of a day because today our Savior was crucified. Today our Savior was flogged and lifted high and beaten and bruised. But Lord, we know it's good because he did that for us. On that cross, our sins were born. And today is the best day in history. So, Lord, I ask that as we convene this evening and worship your name, proclaim the glories of heaven, may we remember the work and sacrifice of Christ our Savior. May we come to know what the cross is this evening. And when we leave this place, may we be forever changed, knowing that we too must bear that burden. But we know that the burden of guilt, of the sins, have been forgiven and have been laid on him. And we can rejoice and be glad. We pray all this in this Messiah's name. Amen. Well, we're going to have uh, Pastor Sam come up and, uh, and lead uh, our first praise <coughs> song. Hopefully you have a little uh, two inserts or two, uh, I guess, hymns there. We're going to be singing Jesus Messiah. It's the, the longer of the two. Yeah. Stand your feet. I'm not sure how you do it here. Ed. Stand your feet. I, I know you can sing this one uh, sitting down. This is uh, really a, a quote from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where, where Paul says about Jesus, He became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. A miracle of that imputation. That's what we celebrate. <laughs> Sing this together.
this evening, we've broken up our message today. We're going to be focusing on one, one verse, uh, a whole evening dedicated to one verse, but I think that's the way it should be sometimes. Today's, uh, our, our passage for today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, or our theme verse, uh, which of course there Paul says, we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. So today, today, this evening you're going to hear uh, a little bit about what the cross is, uh, why Paul says it is what it is, uh, and of course what that means to us today. So for my section, I uh, want us to think a little bit about the impact uh, of Good Friday. In order for us to, to gain a true understanding, to, to really truly wrap our heads around what Good Friday represents, we do have to come to a, a right understanding of the cross. We need to understand what that is. Uh, and we need to understand it certainly within its historical context. You know, we're 2,000 years removed from the events of that evening. Um, but we have to remember that the, the cross was something very specific. And it represented something very specific, certainly to the first century uh, church and certainly to Jesus and the apostles. Uh, and so the first part, I got a little, uh, I'm taking a, a little page on my, my Baptist friends, got a little three-point three sermon tonight, a little three-point sermonette. <laughs> the first part I want to think about, want us to talk about, is that the cross is an execution. We, we have to remember that. We, we can't forget that the cross is a form of execution. If you have your Bible with you, I want you to jump to, pay, uh, to Luke chapter 23. And uh, there's a pew Bible in front of you if you want to take a look, or I know some of you all keep it on your phone. So we're looking at Luke chapter 23, verses 20 through 24. I'm going to read that to you real quick. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. So here Pilate's talking to the crowd, the Jewish crowd. But they kept on calling out, saying, crucify him, crucify him. And he said to them, this is Pilate, for the third time, he said, why? What evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. But they were insistent with loud voices asking that he be crucified. And their voices began to, to prevail. And Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted. So here we see that this was, a, 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 I guess, an imperial decree. Pilate himself uh, gives the order of execution. Uh, and of course, when we, we look at the cross, I mean, we see it here. We have it in our sanctuaries. We, some people carry it around their necks. Uh, we have it so close to us. And indeed, the cross is a symbol of hope. But think about this. The symbol that you, you love and you cherish so much is actually kind of like you're an electric chair. Or, or if you were carrying around on your neck the gallows. That, that's, that's what we do. That's what the cross is. It's this form of death, a form of, of ending life. And that's the second point, that we have to remember that Jesus really died. There are some people, there are false religions, and they're even in the first century church, in the first time of the church, people who said that, oh, Jesus wasn't dead, he was just asleep, or perhaps he never even died at all, that it was all a ruse. No, when we say that Christ was crucified, that he went to a cross, what we are saying is he died. He had to die. He died for us. There's a reason why here in the Presbyterian church we recite the Apostles' Creed. And there's a line in there that says he, um, he was dead, crucified, and buried. Three, three times, dead, or he was crucified, dead, and buried. The, the, the writers of that make it very clear that he was dead. They, had, they said in three different ways they wanted to get the point across that Jesus died. And so we cannot forget that the cross is an execution. Now the cross is also a curse. I want you to jump with me to Galatians chapter 3. Here, Paul, oh, so eloquently, gives to us what the cross is. 
In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, he says this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. Paul, the, the great preacher, the great expositor, always based his messages and his sermons and his teachings in Scripture. And there we see a quote from the Old Testament, a promise from God, that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And so we see that the cross became this curse, but not just any curse. This is the curse of the demand that God's righteousness imposed upon us when Adam and Eve fell. Think about that. Adam and Eve, God's creation in the garden, the height of creation, given such a beautiful, blessed hope. Then the tempter came in, the adversary, whispering into their ears, did God really say? Oh, you can be like God. And bam, sin entered the world. No longer was man willing to submit and rely on the, the holiness of God, rely on his sovereignty, rely on his providence. Instead, they said, we can be like God. We want autonomy. But that's not what was designed. And so God rightly as creator punished Adam and Eve. That covenant that he made with them, he said, when you eat of it, you will surely die. People say there's no grace in the Old Testament. On that very chapter, there's grace. Because God, in all, he had all right as creator, as keeper of the promise. He had every right within his legal bounds, if you want to use that language, to execute Adam and Eve in that moment, but he didn't. He stayed their debt and instituted for us the covenant of grace, which of course culminates in Christ Jesus, culminates in this very moment. Because none of us, since Adam and Eve, has been able to meet that righteous requirement. Because God's righteousness required that we fulfill that covenant. And so he sent for us his son to become this curse, to die on that tree. And that leads me to the third point, which is of utmost importance. The cross is a transfer. Jump with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the Apostle Paul says, He, being God, he made him, being Christ, so God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be our sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And here Paul summarizes the doctrine of the double imputation. That Christ became the curse. That on the cross, he fulfilled the righteous judgment of God. But not only that. By doing that, our sins were transferred onto him. When he was on that cross, he bore the sins of his people. And what's gracious and wonderful is that his righteousness was then transferred to our account. We can stand before God justified, not because of any righteousness that we bring, because Paul makes clear, very clear that none is righteous, but we can stand before Christ, or excuse me, we can stand before God because of Christ, because of the righteousness that he and so this is what the cross is, and this is why we have to put this into our hearts and never forget. Certainly wear the cross around your neck, but every time you look at it, remember what it is, what it signifies. 
We're going to sing our next hymn. You're, I invite you to stand. It's going to be Were You There? It should be on the other handout. Before we dive into that, I want us to pray. Okay. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful. So grateful for this cross. The cross on which our Savior died. Because we know when he bore that heavy load, that strenuous beam, he also bore our curse, our sins. And we're grateful. Oh, so grateful for the grace of his redeeming love. Amen.
Ed share, the, the cross is an execution. The cross is a curse. The cross is a transfer. But the cross is also a scandal. In 1 Corinthians 123, as we've read before, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. To the unsaved Jews, the, the message of the crucified Christ was a stumbling block, something you trip over, uh, an offense. The, the word in the original Greek was a scandalon, which is where we get our word scandal. They, it was just completely offensive to them. In a previous verse, he said that the Jews demand a miraculous sign as verification for God at work. The signs that the Jews craved were not simply miracles, because they had plenty of those from Jesus. They were looking for something a little bit bigger. They're looking for direct tokens from heaven that Jesus was the Messiah. They were looking for the kind of stuff that filled their history. They were looking for the Red Sea parting so that the people of Israel could escape Egypt. They were looking for rescue on a huge scale. They were not looking for a guy on a cross. In fact, the leaders, the Jewish leaders, repeatedly asked him to perform a sign from heaven. But he refused. He said, the only sign you're going to get is, is the sign of Jonah, which they had no idea what that meant. But what he said is, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, I'm going to be in the belly of the earth for three days. The Jewish people stumbled over any suggestion that the Messiah would not immediately overthrow Israel's enemies by the miraculous powers of God. They certainly did not want to believe that the Messiah would be executed by Israel's occupier, Rome, in the most humiliating way possible. After all, as Ed pointed out early, in Deuteronomy it says that a hanged man is cursed by God. How can the Messiah be cursed by God? They were looking for power and they were looking for great glory. And they stumbled on the weakness of the cross. How can anyone put faith in an unemployed carpenter from Nazareth who died shamefully the death of a common criminal? In fact, they called up to him at the cross. They said, if you're the Messiah, come down off the cross. How can you save us if you can't save yourself? Even in that moment, they were looking for that sign. In fact, there's echoes in this taunt of the temptation in the wilderness that we're going to talk about in a moment, where Satan took Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple and said, throw yourself down because it's written that the Father will not allow you, a hair of your head to be hurt. That he will save you. And Jesus knew he would save him. It wasn't the time. And he said, throw yourself down. And why the temple? Because in that place, everyone would have seen the Father save the Son, and there would have been no doubt that would have been the sign that they're looking for. And so here, on the cross, they're looking for that very same sign. But they don't get it. And they just can't embrace that. Now, the Greeks, they weren't particularly offended. They just thought the whole thing was idiotic. They thought it was utterly ludicrous. In fact, the, the word in there that's used for Greek foolishness is the strongest word used anywhere in Scripture for foolishness. And the word here is moros, which is where we get our word moron. It means fool, foolish. It's just they're going, this is moronic. This is idiotic. This makes no sense. And in case we're not sure how utterly disdainful they and the Romans found this, the earliest known depiction of Christ in art anywhere is called the Alex Minos Graffito. It's some Roman graffiti found in Rome, a scratch on a plaster wall, and it depicts a worshiper at the foot of the cross, and on the cross is a Christ with the head of a donkey. Do you believe that? In all of history, 2,000 years of amazing art that we see Christ depicted, but the very earliest one that we have depicts him as an ass. And probably depicts his worshipers as the same. 
For the Gentiles, the idea of God who would serve humanity by offering his own beloved son as a sacrifice for sin was ridiculous. For, from the pagan perspective, strong gods required service from people in order to be rewarded. Only the weakest of gods would serve mortal humans, especially in death. But instead, the Gospels tell the man who was cut off in the flower of his age, his work destroyed just when it should have taken root, his friends scattered, his honor broken, his name a laughingstock. In the words of Isaiah, he was a worm, not a man, a thing despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Furthermore, the Greeks and the Romans looked at one crucified, just as the Jews looked at a, a one who was hanged as being cursed. They looked at one crucified as the lowest of criminals. How could such a one be considered a savior? Such foolishness, they thought. See, the wisdom of the world doesn't mesh with that. The wisdom of the Greeks, the, the wisdom of the Jews, it didn't mesh with that. The wisdom of the world was what Satan offered to Christ in the wilderness. The world says that we have, uh, we, we all have a need to satisfy our needs and appetites, and that since we all have a need to belong and to be approved of it, since we all have a need to achieve something of meaning and value and to satisfy ambition, that we should all do whatever we can, whether it be to placate God or to placate man or to push ourselves forward to receive these things. So in the, in the desert, Satan tempted Jesus. He said, make these stones into bread. And the temptation was become your own provider and satisfier, rather than being in need. To what extent do you depend upon yourself to meet your needs? That's the wisdom of the world. That's the wisdom of wilderness. Satan then tempted Jesus to seek the approval of men, as I talked to before, by a spectacular dive off the pinnacle of the temple, where all would see him survive. And, and this was the sign sought by the Jews, and he would instantly win acceptance rather than rejection. To what extent do you depend on yourself to achieve the acceptance of God and man? That's the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of the wilderness. Then he tempted Jesus to simply worship him, and he would receive all authority without cost. And we over, or oftentimes go, well, that was an easy one for Jesus to, to, to resist. Because, I mean, he was God. He already had all authority. No, not at this point. At this point, for him to be lifted up as king of all kings, name above all names, he had to go through the most horrific death that was described earlier. And he knew it. And what was offered to him was, and I believe at that point, it, that Satan had a right to offer him this authority over all of these cities as far as the eye could see for a very cheap price. All the earthly power and prestige that he could imagine. To what extent do you depend on yourself to fulfill your own ambitions, your own fulfillment? That's the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of the wilderness. <clears throat> It was the Jews that expected in a Messiah what the Greeks would have considered wise, but Christ resisted. See, everything that Satan offered made sense. It was wise. It was a good deal. I mean, we know it wasn't a good deal because we're here now. But to the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of the wilderness, this all made sense. And to refuse it is foolishness. And Jesus, yet he resisted it, and he resisted it all the way to the cross. But here's what the Jews and the Greeks, and you and I sometimes, forget. That what Jesus resisted in the wilderness personally, he defeats on the cross permanently. Let me repeat that. That's the, that's the thing. That's the line you need to remember from this part of the sermon. What Jesus resisted in the wilderness personally, he defeats on the cross permanently. He resisted satisfaction and embraced need on the cross, thus providing a way for us to be fear, free of the fear of not having enough through satisfaction in him. 
He resisted the desire for strength and embraced weakness on the cross so that we could be free of the guilt of not doing enough and find our strength in him. He resisted acceptance and embraced rejection on the cross so that we could be free of our shame for not being enough and be accepted through him. And then we're all faced with living according to the wisdom of the wilderness, which leads to fear, guilt, and shame. Or do we live according to the scandal of the cross, which so counterintuitively leads to salvation, yes, but also to our satisfaction, our acceptance, and our fulfillment by embracing rejection along with Christ, by embracing need, by embracing So according to the wisdom of the world today, I would say according to the wisdom of the world today, not yesterday, is April Fool's Day. Because today we celebrate what the world would say is the most foolish thing that ever happened. And if that's foolishness, I would gladly join Paul as a fool for Christ. What about you? sing our second hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, I invite you to stand. <laughs> Oh, 
dad was a pastor when I was a kid, and I remember coming back from this little uh, church, little Baptist church in upstate New York, and uh, uh, in the summers in New York, that's, that's their spring, like for us, right? So uh, we stopped at a garage sale, and my mom spent a whopping dollar, Bobby. She spent a dollar and got me this um, little Porsche wind-up car. And I must have been about six, and I was obsessed with things. Wind it back, let it go, wind it back, let it go. And, and then I really wanted to know, how does this thing work? And so I took the top off it, and I wound it back, let it go. Finally, I wound it back so much that the thing broke. But curious, and maybe you are too, curious about how do these things work? Okay, so, and that's, that's a good curiosity as we come to our faith we come to assuming you have a real relationship with the Lord and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, how does the cross, how does the cross really change your life? What are the nuts and bolts of? Can we take the, the top of that Porsche off? Can we look at how our faith changes our life, what it really does? And so for the next couple of minutes, that's what I'll do. And let's look at how our, our faith, the cross, changes our life. Uh, really to do this, go back up to verse 18, if you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 18 really is a whole lot like verse 22 and uh, 23 and 24. But let's go back up to verse 18. Uh, Paul writes, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power. And that word is dynamis. It's where we get our word dynamite, dynamic. It's the power of of God. That's what the cross is. It's the power of God. So what is this, the cross? <clears throat> Putting your faith in, in Jesus Christ, his death for you, what does that do? What does that do? And, and what I see is typical Baptist pastor fashion that three things, of course, you knew it was coming. Three things, and we're just going to go right down the Trinity as we think it through. It brings peace with the Father. That's a game changer. It brings peace with the Father. It brings the indwelling Holy Spirit, and it brings New life in the sun. So let's talk about these, and we'll see these in the text as we go down. Uh, the cross has the power to change your life because it brings peace with the Father. Look at verse 19, moving on down. Paul says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to, put your finger on that word, to save those who believe. Save from what? Save from the wrath of God that we all deserve. Born enemies of God, Paul tells us in Romans 5.10. While we were enemies of God, Christ died. Right? Born an enemy of God. This is who we are, separated from God because of our great great grandfather Adam and the sin that we were born into. Born an enemy of God. And at that moment where you trust in Christ and his righteousness is imputed to you and your sin is put on him, you become a friend of God. What, what a mystery of mysteries that is right there. How amazing is that you get to be a friend of God. Of God. And the problem that we all have is, is the sin that we have, also the holiness of, of who God is. Habakkuk tells us, you are a pure eyes than to even look at sin. So if you have any hope of entering heaven because of maybe your good outweighs your bad, that is not the way it works. It takes absolute perfection, the perfection that comes from God. You're probably all familiar with this verse, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through who? Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, our Lord. That's, right. That's the game changer right there. Okay? The cross. As you look under the, you pull the, the top of that Porsche off and you look at what the cross does in your life. The cross brings peace. Peace between you and God. That's amazing. Praise God for that. Secondly, the cross, the cross brings the indwelling Holy Spirit. Let's keep on looking down at verse 22. Paul says the Jews demand signs and the Greeks uh, seek wisdom. Notice that we're going to see wisdom and power come up through this. Okay, so just keep your eyes 
watching for that. The Jews demand signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God, if there were such a thing, is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might be able to boast in the presence of God. We see God giving something to, to humble Christians. We see two things, power and wisdom. We saw them over and over again. We saw them in verse 24 or 26. We see the opposites of those. We see God giving those things. Those things are a gift by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And this is the, the, the miracle that happens to you at that moment of salvation. The Holy Spirit, God, comes into your life, and he gives you a brand new power. And if you've walked with the Lord, hopefully you've experienced this. A brand new power, a, a power to say no to sin for the first time. You used to always give in, or maybe at best you trade one sin for another sin. But you were just a, a slave to sins, and Paul tells us that in Romans 6. You were a slave to sin in one way or another, and for the first time, you're really be able to walk with the Lord in the beauty of holiness, the power to live a holy life that comes to you as the Holy Spirit is inside of you. You, you begin to pray, and things happen. You, you begin to read God's Word, and, it, and it's more than just uh, words on a page. It actually makes sense. Power in your life to do, as Paul would say in Ephesians 2, exceedingly above anything you could ask or think. Power that comes from the Holy Spirit coming inside. That's a, that's a game changer right there. The other thing the Holy Spirit gives you, and we saw this word come up to power in, maybe remember that other word. Wisdom. 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 And, and this is fascinating because uh, in, the, in the next chapter, and you're going to have to take time on your own to look into that, Paul diagnoses how that works. But basically, as the Holy Spirit comes into your life, Paul will tell you that he gives you the mind of Christ. Paul says it like this. He says, no one can understand what a person is thinking. I can't know what Ed is thinking. The only person who can know what Ed's thinking is Ed. In the same way, you can't know what God is thinking unless God is inside of you. And guess what happens? That's what happens to you when the Holy Spirit comes into your life. You get to think the thoughts of God. And that is wisdom, to think like God and act like God. That is a game changer, right? You, you, get, you get power. You get wisdom. You get to be a friend of God because you have peace with God. You get to have the indwelling Holy Spirit. This is what happens. And the, the third way the cross changes in your life, the, the cross changes your life is because you get new life in the Son. Look on down at verse 30. Paul says, and because of him, the Father, you are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Who became to us the wisdom from God, righteousness, our sanctification that's becoming more and more like Jesus, and redemption so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Ah, oh, that's fascinating. You get to be in Christ. This is what happens to you as you put your faith in Jesus. When I was a kid again, I used to love stories, and, and I'm sure you did too, as you, you think about the inanimate objects coming to life. My brother would read a book called The Velveteen Rabbit. The Velveteen Rabbit. Um, there was even a, a really dumb movie in the 80s about a mannequin that came to life. Anybody remember that film? We didn't miss much, okay? Um, there, there was all sorts of, we, we have this fascination with inanimate, inanimate objects coming to life. Yeah, there's Toy Story 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? There's a lot of that. Well, yeah, there's a, uh, there's a lot of that. We have an obsession with things coming to life. Did you know that when you are in Christ, the inanimate part of yours, the heart of stone, as Ezekiel would say, Ezekiel 36, 26. Your heart of stone becomes flesh. That's right. And you become a real boy. Amen. And Pinocchio, right? A real girl for the first time. You come to life inside. During Christ, you come to life. And that, that could be you tonight. I don't know where you stand. You might have been in church your whole life. But this is the time that God is opening your eyes to see the gospel for the first time. You come in Christ. Your heart comes to life today. 
And, and if that's you, come talk to me, talk to the pastor Ed, talk to Tom. Um, I think I even see David Sage back here. All right. You've talked to a lot of people here would love to show you how you can come to know Christ personally, be in Christ. But for those of you who are in Christ right now, you say, Pastor Stan, that's me. By God's grace, I can't believe it. I know why he chose me. I don't know why he drew me salvation. But I'm in Christ. And that's you if you're in Christ. I would say this. Look to the cross again. Uh, look to Jesus again for the 10,000th time. Look to the cross. The cross has power in your life. The cross has power in your life to remove temptation. I don't know what that secret temptation is that you never admit to anyone else right now. But let me suggest something to you. The next time that temptation comes or you're in the room with your phone or I don't know what it is, whatever that temptation is, next time that happens, let your mind drift back to the cross. Remember this. He was wounded for your transgression. He was crushed for your iniquities. The chastisement that brought you peace was upon him, and by his stripes you were healed. And, and that will put a yuck factor in your hands and cause you to push away from that temptation. Maybe your temptation is this. Even though you've prayed and, and you've been forgiven of that sin that you committed five years ago. But, but you just keep bringing that up over and over. And I don't know how you've been. Remember this again. Look to the cross. Remember, he was wounded for your transgression. But don't cheapen his sacrifice for you by hanging on to the sin that he's already paid for. I don't, I don't know what it is. I would say this to you, Christian. Look to the cross again and again and again. When, when you're tempted to fall into the fear of man, which we all know brings a snare. When you're tempted to fall into the fear of man, look to the cross. Why am I afraid of people? The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Right? Jesus loves me. He stayed on the cross for me. I don't know what it is, but it can be combated by letting your mind run back to the cross. The cross is power, guys. Uh, just pull it back and look at how it works in your life. The cross is power. Power to make you at peace with God. Maybe for the first time. The cross is power to give you peace with your Father. The cross is power. Brings the Holy Spirit to your life. Gives you a brand new power. Brand new wisdom to think like God thinks. The, the cross is power. It causes you to be in Christ. Let's look to the cross again. Pray? Okay. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, I, I thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. My, my mind just runs back to 2 Corinthians 5, 21 that we read a second ago. I'm so amazed by the, your graciousness to us, Lord. Sending Jesus, your Son, to become sin, this perfect, spotless Lamb of God, who knew no sin so that we might take his righteousness. What an amazing, amazing thing that we celebrate on this Good Friday Sunday. And we thank you for that. I pray for any person here who might be convicted of their sin for the first time and just see that even though they may have walked in aisle as a kid or something that, that, that really in reality they don't have a relationship with the Lord. They have not experienced this free grace. Lord, I pray that that person would be convicted by their sin would come Speak to us. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters that you would encourage them and strengthen them. I pray that they would have a mind that drifts to the cross often as we celebrate this, not just today, but all throughout the year. Father, I pray that you work in us. We love you in Jesus' name.
job. That's a great job. Well, here on Sunday mornings, we do the ironic blessing, so I'll benedict with that. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And out of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go out into this world living the foolishness of the